Um, and it's our it's our absolute pleasure to have David Bakai here with us today. David is an assistant professor of economics at UCLA. He previously worked at the London School of Economics and graduated from Harvard. Broadly speaking, David's areas of interest are networks and economics and macroeconomics. He's a prolific researcher and he regularly publishes in top general interest economics journals. Today, David will present his paper on the supply side effect of monetary policy. Seems to be a very interesting topic. David, welcome again. You have one hour and 15 minutes in total, including questions. You have the option of taking questions on the go, or you can defer them to the end. With that, the floor is yours. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Girish, for the uh, introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I don't think I have permission to share my screen yet. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. Well, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, so uh, this paper is called The Supply Side Effects of Planetary Policy. It's uh, joint work with Emmanuel Fari um, and Kunal Sangani. Um, Kunal is an amazing graduate student at Harvard. Uh, and I'm sure as everybody probably knows, uh, Emmanuel tragically passed away last year. Um, it's, uh, it's been a little more than a year uh, since he passed away. And I have to say it has not gotten easier for people, for the people who, who knew him. Uh, uh, he was a really special person, both in terms of his intellect and just interpersonally. Uh, and a day has not gone by that I have not thought about him uh, since, since he left us. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, I'll get started. Um, so uh, I, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. I think it's better if I try to answer questions that come up as they come up instead of waiting until the end. So please just feel free to interrupt um, if anything is not clear to you. Okay, uh, great. So what is this paper about? Um, so this paper is um, asking a question that's pretty, I think, um, classic in macro. It's asking a question, is there reason to think that changes in aggregate demand can affect aggregate productivity? Now, the classic answer to this question is no. Uh, Aggregate productivity is determined in the sort of classical mindset. Aggregate productivity is determined by things that depend on technology. And the sorts of things that move aggregate demand, like monetary policy shocks um, or fiscal policy, uh, those are orthogonal to the shocks that determine technologies, at least in the short run. Uh, and so uh, there's no relationship between these objects in the short. Aggregate supply is determined by, uh, excuse me, aggregate productivity is determined by technology and then aggregate and demand is moving us around. Now, if you take this perspective, there's something uh, that's awkward that you have to explain in the data, which is that all the measures of aggregate productivity that we have look like they're highly procyclical and they look like they respond to aggregate demand shocks. So for example, if you measure aggregate productivity using a solo residual, you look at output per worker, you look at um, uh, distortion adjusted notions of the solo residual and aggregate productivity, they all go up in booms and fall in recessions and they look like they respond to things like monetary disturbance. Now, the standard way to explain this is to say this is caused by mismeasurement. We don't exactly know how to measure aggregate productivity. And the fact that we don't know how to measure it correctly means that we see some spurious relationships in the data between aggregate demand and, and aggregate productivity. This paper is gonna offer an alternative answer. It's gonna say, actually, if you write down a model that has realistic firm level heterogeneity, and I'm gonna be clear about what I mean when I say that, but if you write down a model that has realistic firm level heterogeneity, then there's actually a good reason you should expect aggregate productivity to be responsive to aggregate demand shocks. And you should expect it to be pro-cyclical. You should expect the solo residual to fall in a recession that's demand induced if you have this uh, firm heterogeneity inside your model. Um, any questions about this before I keep going? 
a quick one. So the, 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 the uh, literature so far doesn't rule out the possibility that when we, you have these demand shocks, some of the firms can die out, right? Like they can exit the market. And that could also explain fluctuations in the supply side as well. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm going to be not thinking about those sorts of effects. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I think those sorts of effects are going to be different to the sorts of things that I'm going to be talking about. The first one is that there's a sense, um, and we can talk about whether or not this is a correct sense. There's a sense in which at like high frequency, um, entry and exit doesn't affect aggregate variables that much because the guys who are entering and exiting are pretty small. So they start small and then they grow over time. And so at high frequency, if you're looking at these tiny guys going in and out, they're not going to be affecting the aggregate so much. That's the first reason why the thing I'm going to be talking about is different to that. There's a second reason, which is that the way we measure aggregate productivity actually doesn't take those kinds of effects into account. The way we measure aggregate productivity doesn't account for the appearance and disappearance of firms and goods. And so when you see in the data that aggregate productivity is procyclical, you have to have an explanation that's not tied directly to the creation and destruction of products. So, yeah, thanks. David, uh, related to Tushar's question, what about uh, labor as a, as a fixed factor or a quasi-fixed factor? That is an expansion, when your firm expands, you don't want to hire too many workers because you're going to be stuck with them when the downturn occurs. And then when the downturn occurs, you don't want to fire everyone because you've got to do incur rehiring costs when the good times uh, occur. So, so that would give you pro-cyclical uh, labor right. productivity. That's correct. So that kind of ties into what I was saying under my bullet point number two, which is this idea that maybe there's some kind of variable capacity utilization or labor hoarding that we don't see, we don't account for. Mm -hmm. And that's what's resulting in us seeing kind of a spurious relationship between productivity and, uh, and aggregate demand. And what I'm going to say here, so there's two points this paper makes. Number one is that I'm not saying that's not happening. I'm not saying that's not the only thing that could deliver this relationship that we see in the data. There's another force which appears once you have realistic firm level heterogeneity, which can also do that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is actually the way that people identify utilization adjusted TFD, which tries to account for this effect that you're talking about requires an identification assumption that is going to be violated in our model. So that means that like the empirical work that's done uh, in that literature, if through the lens of our model is actually going to be problematic. So I, again, when we get to it, we, I could talk about that in more detail when we have the model. But yeah, I'm not saying utilization adjusted TFP is not, an, is not a thing. I'm just saying you don't have to go there if you don't want to. There's actually a perfectly good reason you would expect this relationship to hold anyway. Excuse me, David. Just just on the uh, you you follow the traditional definition of uh, productivity here, right? It really depends uh, whether your productivity measures uh, technological progress or efficiency changes, right? Yes. There's uh, the uh, different uh, driving forces underlying the two components. Yeah, absolutely. And so this paper is going to be all about efficiency change. So efficiency. there's not going to be any changes in technology here. It's just changes in efficiency that are endogenous to the model is going to create this relationship between aggregate TFP and, uh, and, uh, and aggregate demand. Great. So this is actually perfect because uh, this is exactly what I was about to say. So in this paper, my notion of aggregate demand shock is going to be a monetary policy shock. Um, monetary policy shocks are important on their own, but I think the same logic is also going to go through for other kinds of demand shocks. So in this paper, what we're going to see is that a monetary expansion is going to raise aggregate TFP by improving allocative efficiency rather than technical efficiency, which is, I think, what Jan Rui was hinting at. Now, why might this happen? How could it be that a change in monetary policy can raise allocative efficiency? Well, it's only going to happen if two conditions are satisfied. 
Condition number one is that the initial allocation of resources before you get the demand shock has to be inefficient. If the initial allocation of resources was efficient, then reallocations cannot have any effects to a first order. That's just the envelope theorem, right? If I'm optimally allocating my resources and monetary policy shuffles things around, it's not going to have an effect because of the envelope theorem. So you need the initial allocation of resources to be inefficient. But that's not enough. You also need that the monetary expansion has to systematically reallocate resources from low to high marginal revenue product firms. Basically from firms that are too big from a social perspective towards firms that are too small from a social perspective. Is there a question? Okay, great. Now, in the standard New Keynesian models that uh, people analyze in the literature, it tends to be the case that both of these conditions are, are violated. So first of all, people oftentimes log linearize those models around the efficient steady state. And if you do that, that means you won't see any reallocation effects. But even if you log linearize them away from the efficient steady state, there is no systematic reallocation that takes place for, as a result of a monetary shock. And so you still don't see anything. And you need both of these. But it turns out that both of these conditions will be naturally satisfied if, some, if the following two conditions are true, which are statements about the data that happen to be true. The first one is that firms have variable and heterogeneous markups. So some firms want to have high markups, some firms want to have no markups for whatever reason. If you have dispersion in markups, then the initial allocation of resources is going to be inefficient. So that's going to tick the first condition. The second thing that you're going to need is that firms with high markups should have lower pass-throughs of marginal cost shocks into their prices. Basically, if you're a firm that charges a high markup, it has to be the case that when your marginal cost goes up, you absorb part of the marginal cost shock into your markup. So when your costs go up, you cut your markup and you don't yet raise your price by as much. And this is something, this incompleteness of pass-through is something that's also been empirically documented. Big firms that have high markups have very low pass-throughs. Small firms that have very low markups have almost complete pass-throughs. And if these two conditions are satisfied, it's going to turn out that monetary expansions are going to affect allocated efficiency and therefore aggregate TFP and therefore output. And so that's what this paper is going to be about. It's about building in this a model that's capable of having variable markups and variable pass-throughs, and then showing that such a model has a new channel for monetary policy inside it, which we're going to call a misallocation channel. Any questions about this? Yeah, David, a quick one. So um, first, you need both uh, you know, the, the initial points to be true, right? That in, initial allocations need to be inefficient and that monetary policy has to heterogeneously affect uh, firms. It's not either or or. It, you have to have both. That's right. That's right. You need them both. And the first one here takes this box and the second one takes this box. So you get both. So in the second one, when you're talking about, uh, so I see what you're saying that firms with which have high uh, markups will kind of partly absorb the shock and not translate uh, higher costs into higher prices. But my question is, so are we assuming that systematically higher or uh, bigger firms would have higher markups and consequently also higher productivity? Is that what we are assuming? So I'm going to write down a model that's more general than the standard CES model that allows for lots of different things to happen. And then we'll see what it is that it's going to depend on. But at the end of the day, what you need, it turns out, I can kind of uh, give you a preview, is that you need the level of markups to co-vary with Wait. the level Wait. of pass-through. So it's not to do with size. It's to do with the relationship between markups and pass-throughs. Okay. Now, in the data, those are probably also correlated with size. But in, in principle, it doesn't have to be. I see. What about if all firms satisfy those two conditions? That, so I, ruling out heterogeneity, but couldn't you imagine all firms satisfying yes. condition one and condition two? Yes, 
what's going to be key is heterogeneity. If you don't have heterogeneity, this effect disappears. That's why this effect is different to real rigidities. If you're used to thinking about real rigidities in, in Lucasian models, the real rigidities mechanism is about incomplete pass-through, but people don't put heterogeneity in those models. And so that's why they don't see this effect. Okay. And I'm going to talk about this effect more. I'll show you what happens if you don't have heterogeneity. Uh, David? Okay. Sorry. Yes, please. Can I, please. Can I have uh, one last clarification? Of course. Uh, in your previous slides about markup, is your demand shocks uh, going to change every single firm's markup over time? But in other words, are firms allowed to change their markups in response to the shocks from the demand side? No, there's going to be nominal rigidities. Some firms can change their markups, but not every firm. So uh -huh. this, this is not a paper that overturns the idea that nominal rigidities are important for monetary policy. Okay. All right. Thanks. David, quickly on that yeah. point. That, so isn't the second point like in the limit equivalent to saying that the inefficient firms exist? Mm, no. So if, you, if you're looking at allocating resources from the less efficient firm to a highly efficient firm. Yeah. You take it okay. to the limit. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, it, it is in a very specific way. So suppose that uh, firms... And when you say exit, there's two different things you could be thinking of. One is that firms are paying overhead costs. And if they get too small, they can't cover their overhead costs. And then they exit. So like the firm exists at some point on its demand curve, and then it suddenly disappears. Okay, that's one kind of exit. There's a different kind of exit, which is not to do with overhead costs. It's just that there's a choke price in demand. So the firm gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then the quantity demanded goes to zero and the firm disappears. If you do it in that second way, then you're right. If you do it in the first way, then it's not right. Then you need a different model. Because if the firm is discontinuously disappearing, then you have to think about the area under the demand curve. And that's not captured by national income accounting and an aggregate TFP. And we go back to what I was saying earlier about the creation and disruption of products. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, yeah, David, just, I just follow up on that assumption that uh, you have to hold the uh, markup fixed, no matter what happened to the demand side. Isn't if, that you, if your price is sticky, so there's going to be, if there, I'm going to have count them. So some firms have sticky prices. Some firms have uh, flexible prices. The flex price guys can respond. The sticky guys can't. Yeah. So so sounds to me, this could be another source of inefficiency, right? Because in principle, firms, they face the demand shock. They face the change in the demand curve. Yeah. They, they need to respond, right? If they want to profit, uh, you know, maximize the profit, they has to change the markup. Yes. If you hold them fixed, then obviously that's going to have another source yes. of- uh, Yes, yes, absolutely. You're right. And I'm going to talk about that. Okay. Okay, very good. So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be seeing that when these conditions are satisfied, the ones I was describing to you, an easing of monetary policy is going to improve aggregate productivity. And it's going to look like just as soon as you have a positive demand shock, there's also a positive supply shock that arrives at the same time. What are the implications? Monetary policy becomes more powerful, it becomes more persistent, aggregate TFP falls in contractions, but there's no technological regress. So when you see TFP fall, it's not that we forgot how to do things, it's the model generates that naturally. And then also firm level TFPR dispersion, if you're aware of the literature on TFPR dispersion, in this model is going to rise in recessions and fall in booms. And this dispersion in TFPR has nothing to do with uncertainty shocks, which is something, something that people think about. Like they think, oh, in recessions, dispersion of TFPR went up, that means there's more uncertainty. Uh, and that's not necessarily the case. Finally, what this model is going to do is it's going to generate a flatter Phillips curve, and it's going to tie the slope of the Phillips curve to the amount of industrial concentration. So things like the firm size distribution are all of a sudden going to show up for monetary questions. And then finally, the reallocations that the model is predicting, the ones that are behind these improvements in efficiency, I'm going to show you that they're consistent with the data. Um, very good. Um, so the paper is related to a bunch of different literatures. Um, I, I'm going to skip the relation to the literature. If you guys want, I'm happy to talk about it. But um, 
uh, I don't have that much time, so I want to just jump into the paper. Um, so here's the agenda for today. I'm going to start by setting up a static, simple model, just so we get the intuition, one that you can solve all the way out, you know, pen and paper. And in the static model, I'm going to show you what's the transmission of monetary policy. Then once we understand the static model, then I'm going to show you the dynamic model, like the equivalent to the three equation New Keynesian, to the, uh, New Keynesian model that you would find in Dali's textbook. The difference here is going to be, it's going to be a four equation model instead of a three equation model. The fourth equation is going to tell you what, how aggregate TFT responds to shocks. Then I'll show you a quantitative illustration, and then I'll show you some empirical evidence to say, look, the model sort of is onto something. It's not um, uh, purely imaginary. <laughs> okay, good. Any questions about this? So here's the static model. Um, so the model is going to have three ingredients. Uh, the first ingredient is that we're going to be uh, using a model with monopolistic competition. And the way I'm going to do monopolistic competition is I'm going to use something called Kimball demand, which is a generalization of CES, if you're sort of used to thinking about it. Uh, the model is going to have heterogeneity. Firms are going to have heterogeneous marginal cost. They're going to have heterogeneous markups. They're going to have heterogeneous pass-throughs. And then on top of this, I'm going to layer capital pricing frictions, nominal rigidities. So what's the timing of the simple model? So there's going to be an initial period uh, zero where there, the economy is in equilibrium. Every firm is maximizing, households are maximizing, all the resource constraints. work. Then between time zero and time one, there is an unexpected zero probability monetary shock. The monetary authority changes some nominal price. And now a new equilibrium has to be established. The, there's going to be some fraction of firms that have sticky prices. They don't adjust their price. There's going to be some fraction of firms that do get to adjust their price, and they do. They reset their price. Households adjust, resource constraints hold. It's the usual thing. So I'm going to first describe to you what the household problem is, then the firm problem, then I'll show you what the equilibrium looks like. So what's the household problem? There's going to be a unit mass of identical households. They maximize their utility. Their utility is the usual thing. You maximize consumption utility. Uh, big Y here is real GDP in this model, and big L is employment um, uh, or labor supply. And so there's a disutility of providing labor. Now, the key departure from the standard model is in the following equation that I've written here, which is that output in this model is defined implicitly by this function here, okay? So big Y, remember, is output. Little y is the amount of variety theta that the consumer is consuming. Okay, this upsilon is some nonlinear function, some concave nonlinear function. Imagine that upsilon is a power function. So this is just y over y to some power. Well, if that's the case, you can move big Y over to the other side, and then it becomes a CES aggregator. But this is a more general thing than a CES aggregator because this thing doesn't have to be a power function. And so that's going to be key. Um, this is called Kimball preference. It's actually slightly more general than Kimball preference. And then utility, uh, the maximization problem, subject low budget constraint, where you have to pay for your consumption expenditures using labor income and profit income. Any questions about this before I move on? Just a quick one, uh, David. So small y is the final consumption good, right? Small y is like a variety. So little y theta is like some variety theta is producing little y units of the good. Yeah, but this, this is a final consumption. This is not intermediate. That's right. I'm not going to show you intermediates today. Great. So that's the household problem. Now, why would you want to work with this thing? Why not just stick to CES? Here's the explanation. If you solve the consumer's problem, you find that the demand curve for every variety theta looks like this. So what is this? This is saying the relative quantity of variety theta is a function of the relative price. And what's this relative price? It's the price of the variety relative to some market price index. But, so in a CES, this relationship exists, but this has to be a power function. And here, you can make this be whatever downward sloping function you like by picking upsilon correctly. So this upsilon, by, by choosing it, you can have your demand curve have whatever shape you like. That's important because the properties of the demand curve are the thing that give us the markups on the pass-throughs 
And I want this to be flexible enough that we can model heterogeneity and markups on pass throughs. So the key assumption is that you're doing upsilon theta, right? It's not a, a representative upsilon for, for, ah, for. That's a great question. So you could do just one upsilon for everybody. Um, in that case, everyone is on the same demand curve, but they're on different points of that demand curve. So still the elasticity could be different. The markup could be different. The pass through could be different because you're all on different points of the same demand curve. What I'm actually allowing here is more general than that. I'm actually allowing every firm to have its own demand curve. So we don't all have to live on the same demand curve necessarily. We could, but we don't have to. Yeah. Uh, David, okay. this, this yeah. demand curve, can we just go back to that equation yeah. we're looking at? Yeah. Um, the way that that's written, uh, it's uh, homogeneous at degree zero and the ratio of little y to big Y. Mm -hmm. So that means, uh, I think that uh, it's got homothetic in there. So that right. every variety has got a unit incoming elasticity, which, right. which, which, which rules out a sort of a, 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 non, -neutral, a non neutral type of demand response in, when, when we have booms and busts. So That's when right. we have a boom, people don't go intensively into buying uh, consumer durables foreign travel and that sort of stuff. Yes. They continue to buy food. In fact, food increases at the same rate as GDP, uh, according to this demand function, if I read it correctly. You're reading now, it correctly. It's not necessarily a problem. I mean, if you want to isolate the supply side, uh, yeah. it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a completely satisfactory way of, of, of sort yeah. of. Yeah, so there's actually a very good reason to do it this way. Um, which is that I want you to think of this as a model of an industry rather than a whole economy. So what I'm saying is like the economy consists, let's say, of lots of different industries. And then what I'm showing you is basically going to be happening inside every single industry. So every industry's productivity is going to be pro-cyclical and it's going to respond to monetary policy shocks for the reasons that I'm going to show you. Now, on top of that, you could have some non homotheticities maybe. So the nice thing about homotheticity is it makes it very easy to embed this into a larger model for precisely the reasons that you're mentioning. Now, you could think that like at a higher level of aggregation, there's also stuff happening across durables, non-durable stuff like that. And it's possible that that's happening, but I'm not going to be focusing squarely on that. I have my doubts about quantitatively how important that effect would be. But we can talk about that. Thank you. Great. Okay, so that's that. So so that's what's going on with the household. Let's think about the firm side now. So the firms, I'm going to assume every variety is supplied by a single producer, subject to a Calvo friction. That means that with some probability delta of theta, you get to set your price flexibly, and with probability one minus delta of theta, you have to set the price before observing the nominal shock. So one minus delta is capturing the price rigidity here. And I'm allowing this in principle to vary by firm type. The usual New Keynesian model, this is just a number, but I'm gonna allow it to vary just because we can. Um, production is linear in labor. So the marginal cost of producing goods is just a wage divided by some productivity shifter A. So A is your productivity. And and so firms are going to be saying their price to maximize expected profits. You maximize pro your profits or your sales minus your costs, subject to your residual demand curve that, I, that we just were talking about before. Any questions? OK, so now to understand what's going on in this model, I'm going to have to define some statistics of the demand curves. So these demand curves are going to be really important. So we need to kind of uh, define some statistics for them. So the first statistic that's going to be important is the price elasticity of demand. So the price elasticity of demand is some function. It depends on your relative size in principle. And it's given by the coefficient of curvature of the upsilon function. So remember, if upsilon is a power function, you get CES. And in CES, the coefficient of curvature is a constant number. So in a CES model, this just becomes some number, sigma. But in this model, it's not a number, it's a function. It varies both as a function of the size of the firm, 
and as a function of the identity of the firm. That's the dependence on theta and y. And so you can think your price elasticity can vary in the cross section and it can vary in the time series. Okay. So given that this is the price elasticity of the demand curve, that means the optimal markup that these firms want to charge is given by the usual learner formula, which is one over one minus one over the price elasticity of the demand. So mu here is gonna be a, a markup function instead of a markup number like you would get in a CES model. It varies in both the time series and the cross section. When I say the time series, I mean, as the firm gets big or small and in the cross section, I mean, as you change theta, which is the identity of the firm. So the markup doesn't vary, right? In this part. Yes, exactly. The markup varies. If you can update your price, right. if you can update your price, you're going to set your markup according to this formula. Mm. That's why this is like a desired markup. It's not necessarily the markup that's realized. Okay, so we have the markup. I need mean, one more statistic that's important, which is the pass through of marginal cost into the price in partial equilibrium. So if you take a single firm and you change its marginal cost, how much does the firm change its price? If it can change its price, I'm going to call that number rho. And again, it's a number that varies in both the time series and the cross section. And this is the formula for it, if you're interested. Um, so this rho, if you're not used to thinking about it, um, it's useful to think about what it would be in a CES model. So in a CES model, because your desired markup is constant, rho is always equal to one. But in this model, your desired markup is not constant. So if you get a shock and you move up and down your demand curve, because you want to change your markup, that means you don't pass the price on one for one into your, uh, the marginal cost into your price one for one, because your markup changes. It takes up some of the slack. So empirically, if you're not used to thinking about the pass through, here's a picture to make it more concrete. On the x-axis here, I've got firms as a function of the size percentile. And on the y-axis, I've got the average estimated pass-through of firms. This is from a recent paper by Amitya et al. For firms up to this cutoff in the percentile size distribution. So what you can see from this, the, the dots are the data. I just put a spline through. So what you see here is for the bottom 80% of firms, their pass-through is like almost one. So for most firms in the economy, pass-through is super close to one. They look very CES. -y. But as you start including bigger and bigger firms, the pass-through starts to fall. So that the average pass-through for all the firms put together is only about 0.65. Because the big firms are really not behaving like CES prices, uh, CES price setters. So David, David uh, sorry, uh, just a quick follow-up. If this is really true, so big firms and small firms have very, are very different in terms of their pass through, then I can imagine then the market structure of Meta in terms of the aggregate level, the market structure, in, in other words, the top big firms, how much yeah. market share they account for, is yeah. going to uh, affect or determine the aggregate uh, effect of these demand shocks. Yes, you're right. So, in this case, that in your model, does market structure matter at all? Or this? Yes, yes, absolutely. So that's going to be one of the findings is that, for example, if industrial concentration changes, the strength of monetary policy changes. Okay. All right. David, a, a quick one. So uh, the, the slide that you're showing previously, that uh, so this is established and what you're saying is because of the fact that pass through essentially uh, goes down as the size increases uh, that is what you're using to essentially motivate that it'll have uh, your monetary policy will have heterogeneous effects um, and that kind of checks the, the the second point that you were talking about right yeah so it could be this it doesn't have to be i'm just showing you this so that you get a sense of what this function potentially looks like Right now, I haven't put any restrictions on this function. It could have whatever shape you want. But I'm just saying, if you want a picture to put in your mind about what possibly this function looks like, this is probably not a bad picture to have in mind. But, but I haven't imposed any restrictions on this demand system yet. I will, but I haven't done that yet. Okay, great. So what's David, the equilibrium? Sorry. sorry, David, sorry. I mean, just quick back to that picture. So basically, I mean, 
I mean, your model is going to more or less replicate this, this, this find. I mean, bigger the size of the firm, yes. the smaller the markup. So, but this is, this is a condition that I'm going to impose on this uh, function, this gamma function, right? So I'm going to derive the model's properties without imposing any, any conditions. And then we'll see what conditions you need to sign the effects. So is the effect big or small? What does it depend on? It's going to turn out to depend on some but, but, relationship. But how, how, how you measure size on your model? Size of the firm? The size of sales. So it's the sales share, right? Yeah. Pardon? Ah, it's the share. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So equilibrium notion. The bank is going to pick a nominal price. I'm going to make the nominal price be the nominal wage because that makes the algebra simplest. It doesn't change anything. In the dynamic model, it will be an interest rate shock. So the central bank is going to pick the nominal wage. Households are going to maximize. Prices are going to adjust for the firms that get to adjust. Those are the flex guys. The sticky guys don't have a choice. They, they have to stick with whatever price they have and service demand. Now let's think about the, the, how monetary policy is gonna affect the economy. Okay, so a perturbation in the nominal wage is gonna be how monetary policy is gonna affect the economy. And we wanna think about why would output respond? Well, in principle, output's gonna respond for two different reasons. The first one is maybe the amount of employment changes. This is the traditional Keynesian mechanism. Increase in aggregate demand, increase in employment, increase in output. But in principle, there could be a second effect, which is that output per worker could go up, which in this model is the same thing as the solar residual as TFP. And this is the guy that we're going to be focusing on, changes in aggregate TFP. So let's look at what that object is. Now, I'm just going to show you one more slide with notation before I show you like actual results. I'm going to define lambda to be the sales density of these firms as a function of their type. So lambda is the sales shares. And then if you ever see me write an expectation with a subscript lambda, it just means the sales weighted expectation of whatever it is I'm looking at. And then I'm going to define an aggregate markup. And the aggregate markup I'm going to define to be the harmonic average of the underlying markups in the economy. With that in mind, we're in a position to state the first result, which is in response to a change in nominal, um, the nominal variable, uh, a change in monetary policy or the nominal wage shock, the change in aggregate productivity depends on two covariances. I'm gonna talk you through these slowly. The first thing I want you to notice is the kappas are just constants which are greater than zero. So you don't have to worry about the kappas. So then in order to know whether or not this is positive or negative or zero, you have to think about these covariances. The first covariance is the covariance between desired pass-through and the price elasticity of demand. So if these two things covary together, then you're going to get a boost in aggregate TF. Now, remember, the price elasticity of demand is just the opposite of the markup. So a positive covariance between the pass-through and the price elasticity is a negative covariance between the markup and the pass-through. So if the high markup firms have low pass-through, this is positive, and you're going to get an effect. Now, to go back, I think it was Ken who was asking about this. If you don't have heterogeneity, you don't get anything because the covariances will just be zero. That's the first effect. These are reallocations that happen because of heterogeneity and desired pass-through. But there's also reallocations that could happen due to heterogeneity and price stickiness. So this is the second effect, which is if there's a covariance between the price elasticity and the price stickiness parameter. So intuitively, imagine that for exogenous reasons, the firms with high markups have stickier prices than the firms with low markups. Then you would get the same effect even if their desired pass-through is the same. Why? Because what matters is realized pass-through. And realized pass-through depends on both price stickiness and desired pass-through. And so if either one of those is covariant with the price elasticity, you're going to get an effect. Okay. Very good. Now, the other thing I want you to take away from this is if this thing is positive, so if aggregate productivity increases every time you do a nominal shot, that means that dispersion in firm level TFPR has to be going down. 
because that's sort of the flip side of this. And so that's one of the things that we're gonna uh, that we're gonna have a look at. Okay. So a couple of simple corollaries just to like hammer the point home. Suppose that everybody has the same degree of price rigidity. So the Calvo parameter is homogeneous. Well, then the second covariance disappears and you just get that the effect on TFP depends on the covariance between desired pass-through and the price elasticity. Now, this picture I showed you earlier, we're going to come back to account. If the data looks like this, then this covariance is going to be positive because you've got, this is called Marshall's second law of demand when um, pass-throughs are declining in, um, in size. And it basically means that you have big firms are charging high markups and low pass-throughs and small firms are charging low markups and high pass-throughs. And so you're going to get the effect. But in you this know model- that, uh, that, that law only holds under a certain side condition. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a bit stronger than just Marshall's second law of demand. It has to be, the marginal revenue curve has to be uh, quasi log, log concave if- uh, Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's a bit stronger. Um, that's why I'm calling it a strong second law of demand as opposed to the weak one. Uh, okay. But if that, if that strong second law of demand holds, which there's evidence for that it holds when people try to estimate markups and estimate pass-throughs, then this thing is gonna be positive. But in principle, it actually doesn't have to be anything to do with size. So for example, pass-through could co negatively co-vary with markups for other reasons. Let's say goods have different qualities or they have different degrees of nicheness. So that for high quality or very niche goods, you have high markups and low pass-throughs, then you would get the same effect. And so there's some evidence in trade, for example, that high quality or niche goods do have high markups and low pass-throughs. So that could be another mechanism for getting this, okay? Uh, David? Yep. I understand that in your model, you only include one input, which is labor here. Yes. Uh, but I'm thinking in reality, um, how this monetary effect or this demand shock, what if it operates through not through the labor market, but in terms of affecting the capital, it, would that make any difference? So, um, yes and no. Uh, I'll say no first one, and then I'll say yes. No, in the sense that if you, you can write a version of this model, which has um, more than one input. So you have labor, you have capital, you have materials, um, and all the firms have like the same input bundle. So all the firms in one industry, they buy the same bundle of inputs. They just scale it up and down, depending on how much they need to produce. Under those conditions, and this, these input bundles are like flexible. So like one firm can buy another firm's input bundle. If they're like you're renting the capital and uh, if I'm not using it, then, you're, then, then you can use it. In that case, basically everything goes through on chain. But if you put in some capital market frictions where capital can't move or there's some extra wedge on your ability to get capital, then you're in the theory of the second best. And it's going to depend on how these distortions interact with those distortions. And I don't have anything to say about that. Isn't that the case that, uh, you know, when there are more money available, more funds available, and then so firms have access to these funds, they can use the funds to, to buy, say, better equipment, better machines that can yeah. raise their productivity. But that won't raise their productivity because so like if you that's that's embodied in your um, in your inputs, right? So if I measure your inputs correctly and I net them out, so productivity is output growth minus input growth, and I measure the fact that you're putting better inputs in, then it won't show up as an increase in productivity. But at any rate, this is not about productivity at the firm level. This is about aggregate productivity. If you measure productivity correctly, TFPQ at the firm level in this economy, there's no change. Everybody has the same TFPQ. Okay, so to start with, you assume there should be some sort of inefficient, efficiency in the first place. Which is the markup. They have different markups. The fact, so you see here, that's why heterogeneity matters. What matters is the covariance of some stuff with the price elasticity. That means price elasticities are different. If price elasticities are different, markups are different. 
If markups are different, you have an inefficiency because heterogeneous markups means misallocation. Okay, thank you. That, that, that's great. Thanks for asking that question. To, so I could clear it up. Any other issues before I continue? Uh, yeah, just a quick one. So the price elasticity basically is different from things like quality, different quality in products, things like that? That's right. Okay. So two firms could have different price elasticities because they have different quality, but it's not literally the same thing as quality. Mm -hmm. Um, so the price elasticity in this model is going to be given by the curvature of Upsilon at the point that the firm lives. So you could think of theta, for example, as indexing quality. And then you could say, okay, well, if firms have different quality, then this elasticity could be different for different firms. And that would give you the inefficiency. As long as these sigmas are not the same, you get inefficiency. Uh, okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna push on now. We understand hopefully what's going on with, uh, with TFP, because I'll just go through the intuition uh, very quickly. So the central bank raises the nominal wage. They cause some inflation in the economy. What's gonna happen? Oh, excuse me, I'm on the wrong side. What's gonna happen? Some firms are gonna change their prices and some firms are not gonna change their prices. Among the firms who change their price, the ones who are charging high markups, they're gonna raise their price by less than the ones who are charging low markups. The low markup guys, if you wanna think about it like this, are like squeezed, you know? Like I, my profit margins are really low. So if my marginal cost goes up, I just raise the price. But if I have a huge profit margin and the marginal cost goes up, then I'm gonna cut my markup a little bit. I'm gonna allow my price not to rise by as much because of this incompleteness of pass through. And if I do that, then resources will move from the low markup guy who raised his price towards me, the high markup guy who didn't raise my price by as much. And this reallocation of resources is what drives the improvements in, an, in, in efficiency. Why? Because the high markup guy is too small relative to the low markup guy from a social perspective. The distortion caused by a high markup is that the firm gets too small. So if you could somehow shuffle more resources into the firm's production function, output would rise. Is that clear? So David, yeah, just a clarificatory question there. So out here you are assuming that firms that are having high markups are actually the smaller ones, right? Yeah, sorry, I'm flipping back and forth between size. It doesn't have to be size, but let's say for simplicity, it doesn't have to be. It could be that Girish, you're tiny as a, as a firm, but say you have a high markup and I'm huge. So I'm Walmart, I have a low markup and you are like some boutique grocery store with a high markup, okay? In that case, but imagine that my pass through is one, like I'm Walmart, I'm super competitive. I just raise the price when the cost goes up and you don't. That's enough to get this effect to operate. Size doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just about pass-throughs and price elasticities. It's just sometimes when I talk about it, I'm gonna talk as if the guys with the high markups are also the big guys. They don't have to be. I see. Okay, so that's the response of TFP. What about the response of output? So here's output. The way output responds, there's two components. There's a demand side effect and a supply side effect. The demand side effect is that what you get in a traditional New Keynesian model, and it just depends on the average reduction in markups. I'm gonna explain this in a sec, but let me just point out what the supply side effect is. The supply side effect is the thing we just talked about, that in most models is equal to zero. And in this model, it, it's not necessarily gonna be equal to zero. So what's the demand side effect? The demand side effect basically is the traditional New Keynesian mechanism, which is that when the central bank inflates, the sticky guys can't cut, can't raise the price, so their markup is cut. Because the markup is cut, that stimulates labor demand. Because you stimulate labor demand, you stimulate employment. Because you stimulate employment, you stimulate output. That's the traditional New Keynesian mechanism. So if you look at this effect, it has zeta in front of it, which is the fresh elasticity of labor supply. 
So the demand side effect is powerful if labor supply is very elastic. So that when the demand for labor moves, you get a lot of employment. But if labor supply, let's say, is totally inelastic, is at the zero, the, the Keynesian mechanism disappears. This effect doesn't depend so crucially on zeta. Even if zeta is zero, even if labor supply is inelastic, you're still going to get movements in output from TFP in this model. Okay. Now, what does the demand side effect depend on? Well, here's what it depends on. There's a component that depends on sticky prices. That's the traditional New Keynesian mechanism. And then there's a component that depends on real rigidities, which is strategic complementarities and pricing. And so this is the sense in which real rigidities is a separate story. It's going on, uh, has nothing to do with this effect that I've been talking about. Okay. So, so and, just to be clear, David, so what you're saying is that even if you have a vertical Phillips curve, you still see the right inside. The Phillips curve won't be vertical. No, in case, in case the, the no, no, no. So that's the, that's what I'm saying. If the Phillips curve, is, if it's not an employment Phillips curve, if it's an output Phillips curve, even if employment is inelastically supplied, there will still be a Phillips curve because in output can respond to monetary policy and inflation, even though employment cannot. Exactly. So the right hand side will still be there, even if the left hand side is not. Right. That's, that's right. Well, well. What do you mean the left hand side? If this effect is not there, so exactly. Zeta, zeta zero, so that's not there, but this still gives you a Phillips curve. Yeah, this because the change in Y is related to a change in A, and A is related to the wage. Yeah, yeah. But that's right, exactly. So here's, in fact, the Phillips curve. So here's the wage Phillips curve. Here's the price Phillips curve. The important thing I want you to take away from looking at this is that this D log A term, the change in TFP that we've been talking about shows up in the denominator of the Phillips curve. That means if this is positive, the Phillips curve is flatter. This slope, this thing in front of D log Y is the slope of the Phillips curve. It's gonna become flatter. Okay, great. So just, yeah. I just want to clarify. So here, uh, you have uh, uh, on the uh, okay the demand side effect. There is a uh, aggregate uh, markup there. So it is a uh, count cyclical, per cyclical, and uh, uh, can just have a very intuitive explanation. This is not the aggregate markup. This is the average change in the markup. Oh, average change. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is change. Okay. Okay. It's the average change in the markup rather than the change in the average markup, which is the aggregate markup. So there will be a composition effect there. Yeah, then what about the uh, uh, cyclicality here in the aggregate markup in your model? So it, whether or not the aggregate markup is pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical is going to depend on parameters, basically, and how you like okay. close the model. Okay. It, it doesn't have to have strong cyclical properties. Okay. But empirically, we know the aggregate uh, markup is just uh, like uh, the counter cyclical, right? So, empirically, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of controversy empirically about what it's doing. So, um, but, but yeah, uh, yeah. This effect makes it less counter cyclical. So whether it is counter cyclical or not is sort of depends on the model, but this D log A, this reallocation effect, because it's moving things towards high yeah, market. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I, I'm, yeah, so, I, yeah, I know this, this is not your main concern. You know, yeah. more about the distribution of the markup. I think, uh, yes, uh, because it is a macro paper, some macro yeah. people will raise this uh, question about this, what is the aggregate markup? Because it is a long, Okay, it's a long-term debate on that, as you mentioned. The exactly. So, so, chapter of the Rottenberg and of Michael. Wilson. No, exactly, right? And now, like, the Valerie Ramey <laughs> handbook chapter that's like, well, we don't know. Maybe it's acyclical. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so I would say this model doesn't have strong predictions, basically, about what that thing should be doing. Uh, but it's true that the fact this effect is here is going to make it less countercyclical than a model that didn't have this effect. So it pushes it in the direction of being less counter cyclical, more pro cyclical. Okay. Okay. But I you. think it will still end up being counter cyclical in this in the particular calibration I'm about to show you. It will end up being counter cyclical. Okay. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, great. So I, um, I don't have like a ton of time. Uh, so I've got some examples here, but I think I've made my point. So I I'm going to skip the examples and I'm going to go into the dynamic version of the model. So you saw the simple static model. Here's the dynamic version. So the dynamic version, we're going to assume that every firm is setting its price to maximize profit subject to a Calvo friction. But now it's a forward looking dynamic choice instead of just a static choice. There is a standard consumption order equation for the household that determines how the household does intertemporal substitution. The central bank is going to implement monetary policy using a nominal interest rate. Um, and for today, I'm going to set this stickiness parameter to be homogeneous. So I'm just going to shut down the heterogeneity and price stickiness channel. So here is what the dynamic model looks like. Um, so the dynamic model, it's going to be pinned down as behavior by a bunch of difference equations. The first difference equation is just the Taylor rule that you're familiar with, so I don't have to talk about it at length. The second difference equation is the dynamic IS equation or the Euler equation. Again, these two are exactly identical to the standard model, so I don't have to talk about them. What's going to be different is the aggregate supply relationship or the New Keynesian Phillips curve. There's going to be two differences relative to what you would find in chapter three of Dobby. The first difference is that the Phillips curve, the slope of the dynamic Eucanesian Phillips curve is now flatter because of incomplete pass through. This is just real rigidities. Okay. This is just coming from the fact that you have um, uh, strategic complementarities in pricing. But more importantly, there's an extra term in the Eucanesian Phillips curve, something that looks like a cost push shock. And this cost push shock is going to look like it's that D log A that we talked about, it's TFP. And every time that the central bank does a monetary expansion, this D log A is going to become positive, which is to say it looks like there is a beneficial supply shock that hits the economy at the same time as the demand shock. Well, what determines D log A? D log A, or aggregate TFP, has its own difference equation, which is uh, uh, a second order difference equation that relates contemporaneous changes in TFP to a backward looking component, a forward looking component, and then a component that moves contemporaneously with GDP. And the coefficient on it is that covariance that we've been talking about. So if this covariance between pass through and price elasticity is positive, which is the thing I've been sort of trying to convince you is true in the data, then every time output goes up, TFP goes up, every time TFP goes up, inflation falls because there's a good positive supply shock through this term. And then it has its own dynamic uh, component. The backward looking part is from price rigidity. The forward looking part is from uh, uh, forward looking expectations. So this model and um, the static model that I showed you is a special case of this system of difference equations. If you set the discount factor to zero, if so, so if you make a first myopic and then you solve these difference equations for the effect on the impact, it's exactly those equations I was showing. So this is sort of a generalization of that. Okay. One thing that's neat about this is these three equations are all first order difference equations. But this one is a second order difference equation, which means that this one is capable of generating hump shapes, whereas these ones are not on their own. And the hump shapes are useful because when people estimate impulse response functions, they see hump shapes. Great. So, Any David, questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so in the last equation, endogenous TFP, so why here only the covariance between the posture and the elasticity appear? And why the covariance between the uh, price stickiness and uh, the elasticity disappear. Because I assumed it away. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks. I just killed that effect. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Give it a quick Perfect. question. So, uh, yeah. in in the third equation, it's the uh, alpha d log a that's making the slope of the Phillips curve flatter. Is that well? Clear? Here in the dynamic model, it's not the slope anymore. It's like a cost push shock. In a static model, you could write it as a slope. In this slope. model, it's not a slope. It's just that there is like, it's like there's an endogenous residual in the Phillips curve regression. If you were to run this as a regression, there would be an endogenous residual. I see. Um, okay, very good. So now I want to show you how to quantify this model. So at this, written like this, this model is like super simple to work with now, right? Because you could just plug this into Dynair and it would generate impulse responses for you. And 
The only thing I'm hiding in some sense is the scalars that show up like Kappa, A and Alpha. You don't know what these are. And so you need to calibrate them if you want to run this, put this into Dynair. And so I want to spend some time talking about how to calibrate a model like this. What are these sufficient statistics you need to know in order to simulate this model? Well, you need to know everything you need to know for Galu. So the usual parameters, we need to know them. Discount factor, um, intertemporal elasticity of substitution, Frisch elasticity, Calvo parameter, all of those you need to know. On top of that, you need to know four other statistics to, cap to, to put this system into Dynair. These statistics are the average pass-through, the average price elasticity of demand, the aggregate markup, and this covariance that we've been talking about. Now, you may think if you happen to know what these numbers are, you just plug them in and play, there's no problems. What I'm gonna show you now is a method for recovering what these objects have to be given the data that I started to talk with. So what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna go back to the estimates from Amiti et al for Belgian manufacturing firms. And I'm gonna try to figure out what these statistics have to be by putting some restrictions on what the demand curve looks like. So here's my data that I'm gonna use. And this is pass through, I showed you already. It starts, so here I'm ranking firms from smallest to biggest, and then I'm looking at how their pass through changes. And you see most firms have a pass through really close to one, and then the really big guys, their pass through falls and it goes all the way down to like 0.3. This is pass through. And then we also have uh, sales shares. So if you rank firms by size, you see that sales shares in logs are gonna be increasing linearly for the sort of bottom 90% of firms. So this means an exponential tail because it's linear in logs. And then the really big guys, it's exponential in logs. So it's like a super fat tail for the really big guys. They're really huge. Okay, now in order to calibrate the model, I'm gonna assume this goes to Girish's question earlier. I'm gonna assume that the upsilon function is the same for all the firms. So I'm gonna say, everybody lives on the same demand curve. It's just that we're at different points of that demand curve. That's why we're charging different markups and have different pass-throughs. Given that assumption, I can then solve for the upsilon that can rationalize these pictures. There's like a unique upsilon basically up to a boundary condition that can rationalize these two pictures. And I'm gonna solve for it. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of how to do this. Basically, the pass-through and the sales shares are differential equations, and you could solve these differential equations numerically to get what upsilon has to be. And then once you have upsilon, then you can go back and compute these covariances and, uh, and whatnot. And this method is actually something that Emmanuel and I developed in a different paper, so I don't want to talk about it at length here. We just borrow the, the methodology from that other paper. And then we can calibrate the model and off we go. So David, I'm just wondering here, uh, by assuming Upsilon uh, is homogeneous across firms, do you actually implicitly uh, assume that uh, all these firms actually do not uh, uh, subject to different uh, pro okay, uh, output distortions? Uh, um, no, so the firms can have different output. So an output distortion is like a markup, right? Yeah, so, but it can be, uh, technically, it can be also expressed as a kind of a, a demand shock. That means uh, the, the tax wedge on the output. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. uh, here by zooming. No, 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 this is great. This is great. No, I don't assume that does, that's not there. So in the following, let me, let me try to clarify what I'm about to say. These firms, they can have, you can have taste shifters for the firms. So you can have this idea that like some firms are like, so, so let me say it differently. Imagine I have two firms in the data set that charge the same price. I'm not imposing they have to be the same size. So there could be a taste shifter that allows two firms to charge the same price, but be different sizes. So I'm allowing for like, basically I'm allowing for something in the background. When you rank the firms by size, it's like the product of their productivity and their taste, the consumer's taste or quality or whatever you call it. The product of those is what I can identify. I can identify them separately. And so I rank firms by like something that's like productivity slash quality. 
And then that's the thing that I can get the upsilon for. It's like upsilon times something that depends on product and quality at the same time. Yeah. But I don't actually have to know which one it is. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, you mean that in that block, black box, so now everything is uh, is, is same for all the firms now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So yeah. it's it's more saying firms that are the same size are similar, not firms that are have the same price are similar. So yeah. I'm like all, yeah. ranking them by size rather than by price. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. which is useful, I think, to go to the data because in the data, like, there's no way that. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I understand. That, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. the reason why I asked you this question before getting to the empirics. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, I'm allowing for that. Um, yeah. okay, maybe perfect. let's maybe let's hold the questions for the next ten minutes. I, I see David has to cover quite a lot of ground, so let's <laughs> yeah, hold our questions right. towards the end. Thanks. Okay, so um, here is the static model. So once we've calibrated this guy, now we can compute the static model. So the static model, uh, what I'm showing you here are these Phillips curves, the slope of the Phillips curve that I was showing you earlier in those propositions. And so what you can see here is the numbers themselves don't mean anything in particular. I just want you to compare them across rows. So this is the CES model without any bells and whistles. And the Phillips curve is what it is. It's quite steep, this Phillips curve, relative to what you would expect. Here is what you get if you allow for incomplete passing. So you allow real rigidities, but you do not allow for heterogeneity. So you have one, like a representative homogeneous firm with incomplete passing. Well, then you get a flattening of the Phillips curve, both the price and the wage Phillips curve. And here's what happens if you now allow for the benchmark. This is allowing for the supply side mechanism. And so you can see the Phillips curve slope falls again, and it falls by a similar magnitude as it does for real rigidity. So this effect is actually quite powerful, the supply side effect. It's as powerful as real rigidities are in terms of flattening the Phillips curve. And I'm sort of running out of time. Um, these are just comparative statics showing how the response varies as you change the fridge and how the response varies as you change industrial concentration. Here is the dynamic model since we spent some time uh, talking about it. So I want to show it to you. So here is the dynamic model when you do an interest rate shock. And then here are the impulse responses. So the green dotted line is just the standard CES model. It's Gali chapter three. The orange ones are Gali chapter three plus incomplete pass through, but a homogeneous firm. So this captures real rigidities. And then the blue one is the benchmark model that has that has the supply side channel. So what you can see here is when the monetary policy, when the monetary authority contracts the economy, so this is a contractionary shock, output falls by more when you have this real uh, misallocation channel operating. And inflation falls by less. And this is basically what the um, what uh, we've been talking about. This is sort of intuitively what a flatter Phillips curve sort of is like. And the other thing you could see is that when you compare what's going on with aggregate TFP in this model, you see that in, in the standard model and in the model with real rigidities, aggregate TFP flatlines, it does not change. But in this model, it falls and then it does a hump shaped recovery. And the gap between the orange and the blue is basically given by TFP. That's what's causing it. Because employment in the two models behave similarly. And here is dispersion in firm level TFPR. You could see in the recession caused by the central bank, TFPR dispersion goes up and then it starts to come back down. And so if you're staring at this, you might think, oh, this is like an uncertainty shock because dispersion in firm level product TFPR dispersion went up, but it's sort of, it's not nothing to do with that. Okay, great. So here I'm just plotting the impulse response function for output again, and I'm showing you the relative importance of real rigidities and the supply side effect and how they vary. And you see on impact, the real rigidities effect is a bit more powerful, but as the shock goes out into, uh, um, longer horizons, the, the supply side effect becomes more important. So here you see the impact on uh, the effect of the uh, contraction on impact. You see that real rigidities makes the uh, recession worse. The supply side effect makes the recession even worse. And you could see the half-life of the shock. 
and you see the supply side mechanism is actually making the shock more persistent than it otherwise would have been. And if you sort of look at the area under the impulse response function, so you look at the cumulative decline in output, you see that the supply side effect is roughly as powerful as real rigidities in the dynamic model, as well as in the static model. Okay, so now I have like a two or three minutes. So I just want to give you some empirical evidence to say, well, the model is making a bunch of predictions about how output is going to be responding to shocks. Um, let's see if those predictions are backed up by any kind of evidence. So the model makes a bunch of macro and micro predictions. The macro prediction is that aggregate TFP is pro-cyclical and it should respond to monetary shocks. The micro prediction is that firm level TFPR dispersion should be counter-cyclical. This is something that Matthias Kerrig has documented in his job market paper. But also there should be reallocations to high markup firms during expansion. And so we're going to look for evidence of this. Here are um, impulse responses of TFP and how they respond to monetary shocks. These are like um, local projections a la Oscar Jordan 2005. And I've got different measures of productivity here. Labor productivity, the solo residual, the cost based solo residual. And what you can see is that when you have an exogenous monetary contraction, TFP falls and it has a hump shaped pattern and the amount by which it falls is roughly sort of the magnitude is about half the magnitude of the effect on output. And so that's sort of sort of in line with the kind of magnitudes we're getting out of the model. Um, this actually responds more than the model predicts. And I would guess that some of this has to do with capacity utilization and the fact that these measures are not adjusting for capacity utilization correctly. So these are the macro predictions. What about the micro predictions? And in this table, what I've done is we've gone into CompuStat. Um, and for the firms in CompuStat, we used the um, different ways of computing firm level markups. I can get into how we measure the markups. These are different ways of doing it. User cost, production function estimation, accounting profits. Using these different measures for the firms in CompuStat, we compute markups. <coughs> And then we look to see whether or not high markup firms expand in booms or not relative to low markup firms, which is what the models predicted. And here's what we see. So I have different measures of the business cycle on the left here. So the unemployment rate, NBR recession rates, changes in real GDP growth rates. And what you can see is that both in terms of sales and in terms of costs, the high markup firms are expanding in recessions. And, and shrinking in booms relative to low markup firms. Excuse me, I said that the wrong way around. High markup firms expand in booms and shrink in recessions relative to low markup firms. So that's what these stars here are telling you. It's an interaction between whether you're a high markup firm and the phase in the cycle. Is there a recession happening or not? Okay, I'm like really out of time. So I just wanna wrap up, just mention some extensions that came up um, in the paper. Because everything is homothetic, we show that it's very easy to embed this model into a bigger model, like one with multiple sectors, multiple factors, input output linkages, sticky prices, excuse me, sticky wages. Um, it's very doable. The other thing we do in the paper is we show that you could derive the same set of predictions using an Atkinson Bernstein style model. So a model with oligopolistic competition instead of monopoly because models of oligopoly also produce this thing where the big firms have high markups and low pass-throughs. And as long as the big firms have high markups and low pass-throughs, you're gonna get this effect showing up, regardless of kind of like how you model competition. So I'm gonna wrap up. Um, to conclude, hopefully what you've come away with is that if you have a model that has some initial distortions, in our case, the initial distortions are heterogeneous markups, then aggregate demand has the potential to affect allocative efficiency by causing reallocations. This misallocation effect is particularly powerful if flexibility or pass-through of prices co-vary with the level of markup. And this is going to flatten the Phillips curve, increase in persistence, and part part shape responses, so on and so forth. And so we're working on sort of extending this to other kinds of demand shocks and thinking about implications for, for policy and so on and so forth. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. Very interesting presentation. I think this is a good time to officially end the seminar. I'm sure there are questions. And if David is willing, uh, he can stick around for a while longer and answer them. So uh, any questions?
seems to be very convincing. I also have a question. I think, so. yeah, Leandro, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I mean, Dave, uh, I just try to consider, I mean, your talent, I mean, there's this relationship between the heterogeneity of the firm level and the flatness of the Phillips curve, right? And, uh, for, but I mean, uh, I mean, so th there was, I mean, this great moderation period that was basically was the flatness of the, the Phillips curve. I, I, I don't know, I mean, how you can reconciliate. I mean, there was an increase in the heterogeneity of the firms to explain this flatness of the, uh, of the Phillips curve. Um, so this is a really good question. It's, a, it's something I didn't emphasize in the, in the talk. So here's just showing you what happens in the model. So here's a thought experiment. Suppose that I take the firms and I change the distribution of productivity to make the distribution of employment and sales more concentrated over time. So I'm increasing industrial concentration, okay? And then I look at the slope of the Phillips curve and how it changes in, inside the model. So this is what I'm showing you here. This is CPI Phillips curve, this is the wage Phillips curve. And so what you see in a standard model where you just have sticky prices, nothing happens. The slope of the Phillips curve doesn't depend on this parameter. But in this model, the Phillips curve becomes flatter as you increase concentration. So as the Gini coefficient of firm employment increases, the Phillips curve becomes flatter and flatter. So for example, if you look at the retail sector in the US and you look at the change in the Gini coefficient of firm employment, from 78 to 2018, the Gini coefficient goes from something like um, 0.75 to 0.85 or something like that. I don't remember exactly the number. In the model, that would mean the Phillips curve becomes flatter by something like 40%. Now, um, I think of this as a thought experiment. I'm not saying this is what is happening in the data or that this is what's causing the slope of the Phillips curve to change because there's a ton of other stuff that's also happened. So first of all, for example, inflation expectations are changing. Maybe they're becoming anchor. Um, and that's the thing that causes the Phillips curve to become flatter. And so if there's changes in inflation expectations, then maybe that's part of the story. The other thing that makes me kind of hesitant to push this story too far is the fact that it's not clear if industrial concentration has gone up in the sense that at the aggregate level, industrial concentration has been going up, but at the uh, location, like region level, industrial concentration actually looks like maybe is going down. So for example, Esteban Rossi Hansberg and Pierre Sartre and some people co-authors um, have a paper where they say, if you measure a market as a region rather than as like an industry or the whole nation, then concentration measures have been going down. Like intuitively, basically, it's like if Walmart enters your small town, at the national level, concentration goes up, but at the level of your small town, concentration goes down because now Walmart is competing with these ex pre-existing firms. And then now there's other evidence that's like trying to overturn that. So that whole literature, I think, is in a state of flux. So I wouldn't put this out there as being, okay, this is what's been happening to explain changes in the slope of the Phillips curve. But it is an interesting kind of prediction. It's sort of, I, I kind of view it as being a bit more speculative. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anything else? Yes, yeah, so David, so, uh, thanks for the very, very exciting uh, a talk and uh, here uh, I would like to just uh, uh, ask. So uh, in the end, you just show some dynamic uh, impulse response in different variables. Have you tried to show the covariance between the TFPR and the firm side? I think it is important uh, for us to understand the misallocation here. Uh, in addition to the stand, uh, uh, the step dispersion in TFPR itself. I see. So you're saying look at the covariance yeah. between TFPR at the firm level and what, sorry? For, for example, firm size, because now firm productivity here is you, totally exogenous, right? So in, in your model. Yeah. So, so the, uh, for me, I would like to see the uh, covariance between TFPR and, uh, and firm size. I see. So you would like to see, so TFPR in this model yeah. Is the change in the market. So yeah, changes in TFPR yeah. are changes yeah, or, in the market. Yeah, yeah. Or turns so you're saying you would like to see in the markup and the firm side. Yeah. Yeah. So you would like to see how the markup distribution is changing basically yeah. inside yeah. the model. 
that's a good that's a good point. I don't have that figure. Yeah. What we did look at is how the sales shares of different firms change in the cross sec. So like what's going on to big firms? What's going on to tiny firms? How does their sales share change over time? And we have those plots in the in the in the appendix of the paper, but not yeah. the one you're asking for. Yeah. That one just like uh, the uh snapshot here i think you you want to show the dynamics how no 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 that's what i mean we're showing the dynamics for the sales sheet okay so we okay, basically okay, kind yeah. of say let's take firms at different points in the distribution and show how their sales change dynamically and let's make sure those are not too crazy because like what you don't want to happen is like these sales shares to change in really dramatic ways in response to the shock right like where like the, the high markup firms take over the entire market or something like that. And so we checked to make sure those were not crazy, but we didn't look at the, how the markups change. We could also do that. Yeah, yeah. I'll have another question if I'm allowed to. So here I think it is, uh, personally, I very like the, the, the finding that this uh, a high, mark, a high markup firm actually have the low pass through because it is very consistent with, uh, with my own finding based on the uh, empirical uh, study on, in China. So, but uh, I also found that in the literature, some people say, okay, they may not be very stable theoretically. For example, I think uh, uh, Costas and uh, Uncle Lucky's uh, at the L, he, he has a, a, a note, okay, uh, a kind of paper, so he just, uh, study different uh, demand function and show in some, okay, under some demand function actually, so the path through could be higher for the high markup firms and, uh, and the more productive firms. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm just wondering how general. Uh, yeah, so yeah. it's actually, this is, um, I don't think there's any restrictions uh, in the class of demand systems that I showed you there's no theoretical restriction that says this covariance has to be positive or it has to be negative. It could be, could go in either direction. It's just that when I calibrated the model, I found that it went in the direction that was sort of uh, useful for me. Now, um, there's other models like oligopoly models, you know, like Atkins and Bernstein type models where the prediction that high markup firms will charge low, uh, will have low pass-throughs, and they will also be the big firms is, is like robust in the sense that you get that happening automatically. You don't have to impose something on the shape of the demand curve to get it. It just appears naturally. Um, uh, but in those models, the reason this paper, it doesn't use that model, the reason it uses monopolistic competition is because those models are much more difficult to solve dynamically. Because this model is a monopolistic competition model. And so the dynamics are really, they're more straightforward because there's a continuum of firms. If you have a finite number of firms that they're playing an oligopoly and now they're in a dynamic game and now you need to know whose strategy is what and it's going to become very, very complicated very quickly. Okay, okay. that's uh, what uh, Atkinson, the, the, the paper they talked about, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so Ariel and Andy, they have a paper yeah. where they kind of introduce this kind of oligopolistic competition but they don't have a dynamic model. The one, the, the person who has a dynamic version of this kind of stuff in a monetary nominal rigidities context is Yvonne Burning and Olivier Wong. They had a paper recently, but they assume away heterogeneity to make the model tractable. So they kind of have identical firms instead of heterogeneous firms that are in oligopolistic competition with one another. So you have to give something up. Although, and even for them, even in that case, their model I think is like, is quite, it's quite, challenging to to analyze even yeah. with homogeneous firms so what is the simple intuition behind this uh, uh high markup firms has a low posture so in the model what is the uh, intuition so, here so, oh, to... so the thing oh okay sorry so i should i should be very clear in what i'm telling you so if you go out and you measure the pass-throughs and you find that the pass-throughs look like this which is that they're high for high mark, they're high for small firms, uh, large for uh, low for big firms. And then this tells you that uh, markups have to be increasing in size as long as all the firms 
uh, as long as this condition that I wrote is satisfied, um, sorry, let me go back here. Uh, where is the condition? Uh, this condition. So imagine you're tracing either a single firm along a given demand curve, or you see a bunch of firms living on the same demand curve, okay? And you see that the big guys have low pass-throughs and the small guys have higher pass-throughs, okay? That implies that markups have to be increasing in size. So okay. if you have a monotone pass-through function, it is necessarily the case that the markups are also monotone in the other direction. So if you're interested in why, there is a yeah. Sur yeah. survey paper by Mark Mellitz, uh, 2018. It's, um, it's in the, um, let me, oops, sorry. Let me, let me see what it is. Mellitz, 2018. Uh, it's called um, Trade Competition and Reallocations in a Small Open Economy. I'll put this in the chat. I think this Thanks is a lot. Yeah. And, and in this paper, he basically, he goes through why, which is that if pass-throughs are monotone in size, then markups are monotone in size. It's, this is like why it's Marshall's second law of demand. So Marshall's second law of demand says that, basically it says that markups are increasing in size. And Marshall's strong second law of demand says that pass-throughs are decreasing in size. And the strong law implies the weak law, but not the other way around. Okay. But, okay, but, but uh, I, feel free to send me your paper, by the way, if, if you like, whenever you're done with it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, maybe, Yeah, so yeah. I think uh, uh, so other of my colleague would like to ask a question as well. Yeah. Sure. Amy, yeah. Amy, you, uh, I see his hand is up for quite a while now. Hi, right, thank you. Excellent presentation. So two, two questions. One is whether in, in the calibrations you ever came across with a situation in which the effects of the demand shock works in the opposite direction such that the TFP actually goes up when you have, say, a contractionary monetary policy. Um, so you could construct an example like that. But we never saw that for precisely the reason that I was uh, telling Sean which is that when we calibrate the model, we start off with the estimates from a metiatol. And a metiatol say the pass-through function is declining in size. Because the pass-through function is declining in size, that automatically implies the covariance is always positive. It's never negative. Mm -hmm. And so we, do, we just never see that happen. But, but you could make up some other thing where that covariance was negative. I'm not saying it's impossible. All right, and the, the second one you skipped through the literature review, I wonder whether the, you, you came across some then they say, Austrian economist that they've been working on this idea that monetary policy actually affects reallocation, but they look it from, not from the demand side, I mean the demand from the firms, but actually from different cost structure, say you have friction, so firms have different um, sensibilities to changes in the interest rate. I don't know if you saw that literature. Yeah, so uh, we haven't really connected to connected to that very much. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to think because uh, there's probably, you know, in our model, the only distortion is uh, imperfect competition in the product market. And you might think there's other distortions, for example, in sourcing inputs, like financial frictions would be one of those. And so it would be interesting, I think, to try to, to try to see if these two interact with one another or not. We have Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. So, uh, if there's no other question, maybe I'll I'll ask the last one, um, David. So, um, I I see you're making a nice point when you're uh, doing the calibration as well. You're assuming that uh, the concentration. the industry concentration is having a fat tail uh, but I'm thinking the key bit, the, the juice in your model is just the fact that you you pass through. Uh, is uh, kind of going down with firm size. So even if you assume a Poisson kind of a distribution in firm uh, or industry concentration, your results should still come through, no? 
Yeah, I think it will come through. It's just that like how strong it is will depend on both of those pictures. So one of the pictures was the pass through. The other picture was the sales shares. Yeah. And both of them matter. But you're right that I think it will be positive for basically whatever shape of that sales share distribution I draw. But to get a specific number, I just use the data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see your point. Obviously, that that does make a difference. But I was thinking, even if you assume a Poisson distribution, you should still see, although to a lesser extent, the point that you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fine. Excellent. So, if there are no other questions, uh, I think Shane uh, has a question. Yep. Yep. Can go ahead. Yeah, I got a question. Girish. Can go yeah. ahead. Uh, David. Um, uh, your those. IRFs that we were looking at uh, before, um, the the long run Phillips curve is vertical. Uh, is is this just by by assumption that that the that the that the boom goes away that that you shut off the uh, the expansionary monetary policy or the contractionary so that uh, we're not seeing anything from the model there? Just that's just reflecting what's assumed by it all, yes? Um, yeah, so um, the way that we solve the model is we use the log linearization. And uh, the model um, is, it sort of has this converging properties, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of its derivatives. And so the kind of shock that we feed in can't be too big, basically, right? Otherwise, like the log linearization solution method is not good. You kind of need small shocks. And a small shock for us means a shock that eventually disappears, not like a permanent shock. So if it was a permanent, so the reason it disappears is like the shock, there's a there's like a sh interest rate contraction and then it slowly decays. And then there's a Taylor rule that this determines what the nominal interest rate is. And then it goes away and the economy eventually returns to the original steady state. Um, if we wanted to answer the sorts of questions you're thinking about, we would have to think about like permanent shocks, let's say, like the central bank changes the inflation target or something like that. And to do that, we would have to solve the model non-linearly. And we haven't done that. But I don't expect there to be anything. I haven't done it, but I don't expect there to be anything because after long enough time, everybody will get a chance to adjust their price. So you're just going to go back to the flex price equilibrium just starting at some other initial price level. It's not like this is gonna maintain, you can't like have perpetual growth out of this, basically. Right, that's that's reassuring, uh, uh, thank you. Now, I, I've got another question for you, a point actually. This uh, Upsilon function of yours that generates uh, a lot of your results, a lot of very neat results, I should say, too, uh, I, that that covariance uh, in particular. Now, this upsilon function, that's sort of the primitive function. Your pricing equation is a derivative function of that, yeah? Upsilon yeah. prime. The price elasticity is a second derivative of the yes. primitive. And how the price elasticity varies is a third derivative. That's the pass-through, oh, exactly. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Now, my point is, that if we're talking about a third derivative, this is inherently a rather fragile concept. Yes. So um, it might be useful to uh, uh, to do some invest some time in uh, lo looking at uh, robustness with respect to upsilon and these sorts of things. Yeah, I don't know if so you've done that. So this is, a, it, I would say it's a little flipped around from the usual way we think about these things, because it turns out empirically, the, the higher derivative, the higher the derivative, the easier the object is to identify in the data. So a pass-through is way easier to identify than a markup, which is a second derivative. And a markup is way easier to identify than the shape of the demand curve itself. And so, and so because like with pass-throughs, 
you can have like exchange rate shocks or something that move your marginal cost and I can just look at what you do to your price and I get the pass through. But to get the shape of the demand curve, that's a much more challenging thing to do. Or to estimate the markup, that's a much more challenging thing to do. So that's why I think the fact that we actually start with this pass through thing as it's like been measured in the data and work backwards is reassuring because you're right. If you start with the, with the first derivative, so imagine I told you an estimate of the shape of the demand curve that I got, and then you differentiate it two more times to get the pass through, good luck. Like something that looks the same in, in like levels, when you differentiate it two times, it can look completely different. So that's like, that's the bad direction, right? Which is that you try to estimate um, Upsilon prime with a lot of uncertainty and then you differentiate it twice and then you get garbage. But if you go in the other direction, which is you estimate Upsilon triple prime with some uncertainty and then you integrate it to get Upsilon prime, then those errors are gonna be smaller. If that makes sense. That's a good response. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And so I think, think since we are way past uh, the official time, I think this would be a good time to end the seminar. Uh, David, thanks a lot for a very interesting